It's a beautiful morning in the southern mountains of Appalachia. We've had some rain, which I'm so excited about. We had about three weeks with no rain and our garden was really suffering. We were having to water practically every day, but things just with the, the day of rain we've had, things are just popping now and I swear stuff's grew overnight. This is the first year, as I show you around my garden today, I wanted to show you this little part first. First year, and I don't know when, that I've actually started some stuff in containers. Yeah. So I have some thyme growing in this great planter that Corey gave me. I raided Granny's basement for some, so I've got, this is some uh, holy basil. You can barely see one little start there coming up. This is some uh, black-eyed Susan vine. I used to grow it all the time, but I hadn't grew it in years. These two pots have not come up yet. One is uh, calendula, and I can't figure out why it's not come up, because uh, that's an easy one to grow, but the nettles, I cannot grow nettles. And then back here in this one, I have some flowers. Um, the name of them are Godisha, maybe? I can't say that right, probably. But anyway, I've grew those before, too. Beautiful blooms. You can see those. And then, of course, I have one little nasturtium back there in the back. Actually, two nasturtiums. There's one. And then this is a geranium that a wonderful subscriber sent me. So you can see the new growth on it. It's doing well. And you can see how much it's rained. See how full the uh, things are that I need to empty. So this is some, an area where we have some cattle panels. And if you can see up there behind, that's our blackberries. Matt and I just put that cattle panel up uh, last weekend, so it's new. And I had a lot of people asking me, how, how do we use cattle panels? How do you actually put them up? Well, there's all kinds of videos with people kind of giving a tutorial, but basically just a general overview is we have the cattle panel and then we have T-post, metal T-post. So Matt hammers those into the ground, you know, pretty deep. I, I couldn't do that by myself for sure. And then we hold the cattle panel up and then we secure it with tie wire. So that's how we do it. I've seen some videos where people use uh, zip ties. So that's another option if you don't want to go with the wire part. And then we just um, put them up off the ground, you know, maybe about a foot or something like that. So that then as the beans or whatever it is climbing up them, right here I have rattlesnake beans, then it gives them, you know, a, a higher part to climb up. That's the reasoning behind not putting it directly on the ground, although I guess that would work also. I'm really excited about this part of the garden. This, on this first cattle panel down here, we have some rattlesnake beans. We grew those for the first time last year and they did so good for us. And as you can see, they're just beginning to vine out where they'll start climbing up the trellis. And so they're doing really good this year so far too. At the other end, where we still have some uh, rattlesnake beans, the real purpose of putting this trellis up in the first place was on that end, we have two grapevines that we planted. We planted two last year and they didn't make it, but you can see these this year, the ones we planted this year are all leafed out and they're doing really good. And even one of them has even already reached the bottom of the trellis. So eventually over time, when those grapevines grow and they begin to go all over that trellis, we won't plant anything there uh, at that time in the future. So the blackberries up above, they are just going crazy. We planted some of them last year. One of them we had in a different part of the yard and we just moved to this area. And then I, I bought some. This year I've bought a few more, a different variety, and we've planted those. But the ones from last year have just went crazy. Uh, and they're really doing good. You can see how loaded down they are with berries. Now, we didn't get our trellis up until last weekend, like I said. So I need to weave, kind of weave some of the vines in that trellis, but I'm afraid to weave the ones that are really hanging off the edge of the bed because they've got so many berries on them, I don't want them to break. So, so that might be something that I kind of, I weave in a few of them, but then I wait until after this year's berries are done before I really try to aggressively make them grow up that trestle. Trestle. It's a trestle. It's a trellis. <laughs> Sorry, not a trestle, a trellis. Uh, I wish I had a trestle, but that would mean I'd have to live by a train track, wouldn't it? So in this part of the garden, the first little bed is our herb bed. Uh, some of the stuff that's in it's been in it for several years, and then I planted a few extra things in it this year. 
uh, the large things that are in it is lemon balm. We have some lemon balm, and then we have valerian. Uh, Corey's been harvesting the lemon balm, so it's, there's some of it missing, but it spreads so easily. That's one of those things, if you get started and it does really well for you, you can harvest it pretty much as often as you want and still have more come back. We also have a large amount of oregano in this bed, and we've been um, harvesting it a little bit already this year, and Katie loves to really get big loads of it and dry it. She'll have it laid out. It's the easiest way to dry it. You can dry it in a dehydrator or something like that, but she will just literally lay it out on the porch, lay it out even in her room uh, where she can barely walk sometimes, but then it doesn't take it long to dry, and then once it's dry, you can remove it uh, from the stem and actually store it to use in your kitchen or wherever else you'd want to use it, but we primarily cook with it. This year I've planted, I always put some dill in here for making pickles. I just think dill smells the best. It's such a fresh, clean scent. But we, so I have some of that growing. I actually had some of it re-volunteer uh, from last year, which is really exciting. I would love to have that happen even more this year. Also, I planted some lavender, some parsley, and some rosemary that I bought at Satterfield's Farm. If you've never been there, that's a great place to go in Robbinsville, North Carolina. And I just can never resist, even if there's one little bare place of a soil that's open, even if I probably shouldn't plant something there, I just can't resist. So back in the back of the bed, I planted about three or four bush beans and they're up doing really good. Here's the valerian that's in this bed. You can see it gets almost as tall as me and it's little tiny white flowers, but they're really pretty and they smell wonderful. Uh, valerian is used as, as, can be used as a sedative medicinally, but we've never used it like that. But the last time I mentioned that, several of you give some good, great tips that I shared with Corey. Corey's kind of our medicinal person. Katie is too, a little bit. Uh, Katie and Corey both, I just let them handle most of that. So hopefully Corey will be able to follow up on some of those wonderful tips that subscribers left. Two other things I forgot to mention in this bed is yarrow, and it's up and it's about to bloom. It's got its little buds, you can see, and then also some sage that I got from Satterfield, the Satterfield Nursery. We had sage growing here and we harvested it last year, and it's been here for several years and done very well, but somehow over the winter, it all died out. So these two beds right in front of our greenhouse, they are really coming alive. One of the first things you may notice are the really large onions. <laughs> Those onions actually overwintered. They've been there since last fall. They were a couple of little onion buttons that I planted last fall. So I either need to pull them up and actually go ahead and eat them. I've been meaning to do that. Every time I'm gonna uh, use onion for supper, I think I'll run out here and get one and then I keep forgetting to do it. And if you can hear our chickens in the background, they're going crazy, and I almost guarantee you that's Clover. If you watch the girls' channel, you'll know that Clover's the chicken that Katie saved, um, nursed back to health, and she's a great egg layer, but she never hushes. And that's probably her telling everybody, I just laid an egg. Or who knows with Clover, she just never hushes. <laughs> she's very, she's making up for all that time that she was hurt and she's very vocal and lets the whole world know that she's a here and that uh, she's alive and kicking and, and wants you to listen to every little thing that she says. So this cattle panel arch here, we did it the same way as as far as attaching it to T-posts that Matt drove in the ground. It's two panels, and then they're just bent over to make that arch. And on one side, I have my cucumbers, which grow, do so good growing up something like that. And then on the other side, I have melons. I have some, um, mostly some watermelons, little, little small watermelons, and then um, Minnesota midget and those kind of cantaloupes. That's what I have growing there. Around the edges kind of of the bed, that's usually where we do our peppers. So I have a variety of different peppers growing. I have quite a few. And my peppers, I hope they produce. I hope this is the best year ever for production. But it's definitely the best year ever as far as getting them to a certain height before I actually put them out in the garden. Starting, I started them inside under grow lights uh, and really babied them and took care of them and then up potted them. So by the time we put them in the ground, they were, you know, like the ones, the starch that you would buy at the store. Mine typically that I start in the greenhouse have never been that big they're more like this and then as they it takes them so long to catch up that I usually don't really start getting a good pro, uh, pepper production until fall of the year so I hope that 
since they were so much larger when I, we actually planted them, that that helps this year. In these beds, I also have a whole lot of volunteer tomatoes. And it's a little bitty, I'm guessing, I'm thinking, because that's what was here last year, a little bitty Tommy Toe that's called uh, Matt's Cherry. Little tiny red tomato, but really good. And that is so prolific that the it's been several years since I actually planted it. But the first year that I did, and I had it maybe in one or two places, and then, you know, birds and different things, and maybe compost, and how it's just got spread all around my garden. Uh, my gardens and I have some in the front of the house and one of the flower beds then it comes up here I've got some down there and it's just the teeniest little tomato So it's really hard kind of to as far as putting up or doing anything with because it's so tiny But it's the perfect little snack to just eat as you're going through the garden or outside working Or of course to put in your salad or something like that For the last couple of years. I've really tried to think about uh, making the garden more beautiful. It's beautiful if it's just a cucumber growing or a tomato that was beautiful when they start to, uh, the shoulders of the tomatoes start changing color and there's still some green. Oh, so pretty. Uh, the tomato blooms, all those kind of things are beautiful. Squash blooms. But for many years, when I first, now when I was growing up, I helped Granny and Pap garden. That was just part and parcel of our life. But when Matt and I first moved into our house, was first married, uh, going on almost 30 years ago, we didn't have much room, even as much, we still don't have much room. Matt likes to say we live on a goat bluff, but even then we had even less room. And I, I didn't think about growing vegetables. I still helped Pap and Granny when I could in their garden, but I grew flowers. I was crazy about flowers. And then at some point I began to realize, well, I should be growing food to feed my family. Uh, and that was part of the reason behind us re doing some regrading around our house, that and to give Corey and Katie a place for a swing set and to ride their bicycles and those kind of things. So once I started thinking about growing food, I just kind of totally forgot about flowers. I still had flowers that I'd planted, you know, they were still around, but I didn't, I just didn't care about them. I didn't worry with them. And then a couple of years ago, I started thinking, I started seeing actually some on YouTube in different places where people maybe in the edge of their tomato bed or their cornfield or whatever, they would plant some flowers. They would plant, um, you know, a sunflower, some xenon, or something which reminded me any of people that live locally there's a house over when you're going to Blairsville actually when you're going to Union General Hospital if you come I don't know the name of the road but probably if you're from not from Blairsville and you're coming the way I do you'll go past it too and it just sits right on the side of the road. They always have a beautiful garden so you can see it because it's right there and the house is kept real neat in the yard and all that. But they always have like two long, as long as their garden, rows of zenas right there with their vegetables. And it is so beautiful. And I've noticed it for years. So when I started seeing that, I thought, well, yeah, it's like that house over in uh, Blairsville. That's what they do. They put those beautiful zenas right with their corn and taters and everything else. So ever since then, and I've kind of tried to see if I could sneak one in somewhere. Matt doesn't always like that though, because then he has to worry about if he's uh, tilling or, or weeding or whatever or hoeing, he has to worry about my flowers, but, but he puts up with me doing it. So I've, I started out by putting some sunflowers a couple of years ago, maybe one at each end of the bean, uh, long bean panel, something like that. So this year I was continuing that and I have some volunteer sunflowers after that that'll come up since I started doing that a couple of years ago. But this year when I was thinking about that it was still really chilly outside and we hadn't planted anything and I thought I'm also like fascinated by the you know the volunteers like the volunteer sunflowers I was just talking about nobody planted them I mean I didn't plant them I didn't think oh it's finally warm and the soil is at this temperature and I could plant them they were just laying there and then nature made them sprout earlier than anything else they were there before we planted the tomatoes you know and again Matt had to be careful with my two volunteer sunflowers and one of them is even inside one of the tomato cages but anyway, I, start, I, I love thinking about that. So there is a whole, and I don't know what it's called, you probably do, but a whole thought process about you can just leave the seeds, kind of put them out there when it's not the most um, greatest opportunity for them to grow and let nature take its course. So maybe you'd put your cabbage seed or something out there it, when it's way cold in the winter and just wait and see what happens. And then maybe it'll sprout, you know, the same way my volunteer tomatoes or my volunteer sunflowers do. So with that in mind, or really early this spring, 
when it was still really cold outside, I went around to some of my beds back here and just stuck in some little nasturtium seeds and thought, I'll just see what happens. Because I love nasturtiums. You, they're edible, so that's a good thing. They have, have a peppery taste, but they are so pretty because they're low growing and they have these flowing kind of big leaves that are uh, beautiful just like that but then when you see a piece of some water on one of them it's like a diamond glinting in the sunshine it is so pretty they are like it's like they're uh, water resistant granny used to when i was a girl one of her jobs she did clifton precision was a local factory and you could work there at the plant but you could also take stuff home and work on it and then work on it at home and then bring it back and granny did that for many many years and that way she could be at home to help in the garden to do whatever kids you know what we needed her to do to cook supper and wash clothes and do all that but she could also work on that kind of like a part-time job and then take it back to him and get paid and I don't, can't even remember exactly what she did, so I don't, I don't know that. But I was fascinated with it. And, of course, we were not allowed to touch it or be near it or anything. But there was a little uh, container that she had to do something with mercury. And it had... It was in this little bitty, I mean, just barely any. But I remember seeing it when Granny would use it sometimes. If a piece dropped, it would just kind of sit there and kind of slide around. And that's what those nasturtiums remind me of. So my strawberries I planted last year in the green stalk are really doing good. You can see I've got berries here. That one's like ready to eat, so I'm gonna have to have to eat it. Mm. So good. Me and Corey have been buying strawberries at the local produce stand this year, but they can't beat that one. Oh my goodness, so good. So they're doing good, they're doing great. They did so great for me. I could tell last year they were really loving this that I planted another green stalk. My other green stalk's got strawberries in it, but I just planted them this year, so they're not really bearing berries yet. I do have one or two holes, uh, little container holes in this one, this green stalk, and in my other one where I put the strawberries this year that were empty. So I went ahead and put some kale and lettuce in those, and they're coming up. So I'm gonna, that's just like another kind of my my lettuce and stuff I planted up in the front of the garden which I'll show you in a minute this is kind of another way like that'll start dying back kind of because we're harvesting it because it's getting hotter but here's some more just kind of coming on right near this other green stalk that I also planted strawberries in I have kind of a collection of little bitty small grow bags uh, and two of them have calendula flowers on, in them, which I could probably put out somewhere else if I wanted to. One of them has some uh, Lenten rose that a uh, subscriber sent me. So I'm excited to see it's supposed to be a different color than the one that I have. He also sent me an iris, so there's the iris. And then in this one, I have planted foxgloves. And they're, I hope that's what it is coming up. Sometimes I think it is, and then sometimes I think it's not, but I did plant them in there. So hopefully I'm gonna have foxgloves for the first time. And some of our other bigger grow bags, we have tomatoes, I'll show you those in a minute. And then some of them we have potatoes. We planted potatoes in them last year and they did so good. So some of the potatoes are really big. We planted them early. And then um, about a week or two ago, I guess, Matt come home from work and one of his buddies had been planting potatoes and he'd brought to work what he had left that he didn't wasn't gonna use, so Matt brought them. So we planted them. So some of our potatoes are not as far as um, along as the first ones we planted. But a lot of you have asked about the grow bags. So you can see they're kind of, it's kind of like a, in between, I guess, a fabric and a canvas, but they're really, you know, light and flimsy kind of, but very sturdy. And then they just take on the shape of the dirt that you put in them. Now this is a really big one. I think this is a 30 gallon one. Uh, and you can get them as small as the ones I was just showing you that had the, the flowers in them or as big as this. And last year's the first year we used grow bags and they did so good for us, so good that we just, we wanted to use them again this year. Now, I guess you could empty them and take them inside and maybe they would last even longer, but Matt and I didn't do that. We left them outside all winter. So we'll see if that, how that, if that, you know, affects the length of time that uh, they will last or not. And if you have information about that, please share it. But it's just such an easy way to, to grow things. And they're fairly economical. I mean, you know, you do have to pay for them. They're not free. Like some people that do container growing, growing in uh, milk, milk jugs and things like that. But so far, we've just been so pleased with them. And they come in different colors. And I've heard uh, some people say that you shouldn't get black 
uh, maybe they lived in a hotter climate than we do so that they, it absorbs so much heat. But for us, the black worked fine. And also, um, some people had a problem with them drying out, like they just dried out too fast. You know, well, these little small ones that I had the flowers in, I noticed they do dry out pretty fast because they're so small. These large ones that we grew in last year, we didn't really have that problem. But it's probably not fair saying that either because we live in a place where we get ample rain. So if you lived in a really dry place, they might dry out on you too. So this is behind the greenhouse. Matt and I last year wanted to build a garden back here, kind of put some winter squash or something and just let them go wild. It didn't happen. We want to do it this year. It's not happened yet, but I'm still hopeful that it will. But I did plant one thing back here kind of on the bank. If you watched my videos last year, you'll remember that I grew for the first time the lychee tomato. See those sharp little spikes there? So that's why I put it back here. Last year was the first time I grew it, and I grew, I put it actually in one of my grow bags up front in front of the greenhouse. And every time you had to go by there, it because it got huge by the end of the year, way taller than me, and it was kind of leaning over, those spikes would get you. So the girls and Matt, they were all upset about it. And uh, when I first tasted the fruit, which is nothing like a tomato, it tastes more like a fruity fruit. It's just a little red tomato. You can research, lychee tomato. I thought, well, it's just not really that impressive and I won't never grow it again. But by the end of the summer, I really loved it. I just kept eating them and I, the more I ate them, the more I liked them. So I wanted to plant more this year. This was another thing that volunteered. So up there where I had it before, it volunteered. It, I've got them coming up on the ground, inside the green stalk that was sitting beside it. And of course, inside the uh, grow bag that I had it in but I, I knew everybody was too upset with me. So this year I, I started, I didn't know those were gonna come up. So I started two inside thinking, maybe I'll plant it outside, maybe I won't. But then, so these did so good inside the greenhouse when I was, after I'd started them that I thought, well, I can't just throw them away. So I brought them back here out of the way and I put them right here and hopefully they'll do really good for me being right here. So in this big bed, we have another, um, arch here that Matt made out of the cattle panels and then just behind it we have two long sections of cattle panel and that's where we've grown uh, a lot of tomatoes on those two long sections that's where all of our Cherokee purple is that's our favorite tomato but on this section right here this is where I'd grown the first year I guess that we had it I found out about Malabar spinach I really like it so I've been, I grow it over this by the end of the summer it is completely covered in Malabar spinach What's happened over since then, um, which is really wonderful, it reseeds itself. So the seeds drop and it comes up. So last year, I think I actually planted one or two. This year, I didn't plant any because it's just, there's so much that has reseeded itself that I've had to pull a lot of it up. I feed it to our chickens, but it is just so crazy how thick the Malabar spinach is where it reseeded itself. Also in this end of the bed is some wild apricot, maypops, some people call them. Uh, Katie planted them years ago and they just come back every year and they just have the beautiful, if you've ever seen them, the beautiful flower, uh, so pretty. Some people call them passion fruit and Katie made jelly out of them one year. I can't remember if that was last year or year before, but hopefully we can get her to show us how to make jelly from them this year. On this side of the greenhouse is where we have those other grow bags I was talking about. The last three have those extra potatoes that might come home from work with, but the rest of them have tomatoes. And we kind of put the ones uh, in those that we've not, not our tried and true ones. So the um, gooseberry, there's a yellow gooseberry, golden nugget, um, black Russian, Italian pay, some of the ones that people had sent me the seeds for, and then some of the ones that I just couldn't resist trying. So this is one of the apple trees we planted last year and you can see it's got little apples on it. And I'm terrible because I can't tell you what the name of it is. I've got it wrote down inside the house. I'll try to remember if I can find it and put it in the description, but at the moment I can't. Down here's a little bit more, a few more apples. A lot of people say that in the first few years you should like pull off the blooms and not let them actually make apples, but I just can't make myself do that. This is the second year we've had this tree or maybe the third year third year mm -hmm. yeah third year I think so in this little bed of tomatoes this is mostly uh, like the tommy toe type tomato sun golds and black cherries and Juliet's 
I think they're all in this one. And then you can see the, the giant sunflower I was talking about that reseeded itself. And then there's one inside this tomato basket, which I probably should have let Matt pull up, but I just couldn't do it. I see another one that started right here. This is our largest apple tree. We planted it many years ago. When we planted them that time, I think Miss Cindy got them for me one year for Mother's Day. We planted three trees. We quickly lost one of them. And then we had two that produced really good and, and grew large. And then one of them a couple of years ago just died. We just lost it. Um, it. I don't know what happened to it exactly. It rotted at the bottom and Matt thought it was dead and he went over and pushed on it and just one push in spring of the year, it just fell over. So anyway, this one looks really good this year. It's like a an old time kind of golden delicious, but I don't see any apples on it, even though it looks so healthy and good. There's another apple tree that we planted at the same time we planted the one I just showed you with the apples, and uh, it doesn't have any on it this year. And then there's one little one about this big that was come from seed that Granny started. Also back here in this back part, we have a um, some elderberry bushes. I've wanted elderberries forever and I finally got some this year. Pastor Lon and uh, Robbie Lynn, they brought me some from their house so that was so kind of them. And then I also, that day we were at Satterfield's, I got a fig. I've always wanted a fig. I, I'm hoping that it'll do good. He told me that I didn't need another one. I just needed that one. And we tried to kind of put it in a kind of a protected place. I don't really know that it's that protected. I wanted to put it by the greenhouse or by the house or by the chicken house, but there's just we just have such limited space. Sometimes it's hard. I wanna grow so many things, but it's hard to find just the right place to put them. So there's one little bed up here at the top and then one that matches it on that side. Those are our asparagus beds. So asparagus time's kind of gone for this year. Uh, and you could kind of see the fronds where they have their seeds on them. And we just let them, let them go and that way they'll reseed. They drop out and hopefully they'll take root and have more asparagus. But in the lower end or the uh, lower portion of this bed right here, I planted peas. This is my Mississippi pink eye peas. And I can't wait to try them. And you can see that they're coming up and doing well. So this cattle panel is another one that we put up for grape vines, like the one in the back. So we have two established vines on this one, uh, one on this end and one on the other end. And this one is loaded with grapes this year if nothing happens to them. You can see some of them there just starting out, little baby grapes. And down below, not wanting to waste any of that wonderful space that we have, we have peas, this whole little, it's just really narrow, a little narrow bed, but it's full of peas that can then grow up the cattle panel. So this is one of the many blueberry bushes we have scattered all around. You can see the, see the little berries. This variety right here, I can't remember the name of it. Matt got me this one year for Mother's Day when I still worked at the college. And um, it's more of an earlier variety. So it'll get, it'll get uh, ripe sometime in maybe June, end of June, July. My other ones, most of them are late barren. So it's almost August before they ripen. More tomatoes down here on these two cattle panels behind me. And these are mostly Arkansas Traveler and Mountain Princess. Those are two of our tried and true that we really love. Both produce kind of red, you know, average size tomatoes that have really good taste. They're really prolific for us and they're good for canning, really great to put up. At the end of each, uh, kind of at the end of the middle part and then on each side, again, I planted some flowers. There are, a lot of them are coming up, but they're just about that big so far. So we'll have to continue to, to watch them, but that's something to look forward to as the year progresses. So in this large part, this is our largest part of the garden. We have two long rows of green beans. You can see they're up and doing good. We have a row of peanut beans. I have my squash and my zucchini, one on this end and one on the other end. Uh, I think this end is, I can't remember. I'll have to wait and see. I think this end is, 
I think this end is zucchini. I think the other end is squash. Anyway, but we have that here. And then I have the okri that I planted. Now, if you watched my video when I was talking about planting the okri and I, I uh, soaked some of it overnight, which people have told me to do for years, and I've never done that before. And then I didn't soak enough, so when we were out here planting, I had to run back in and just get seeds that had not been soaked, and we planted them. And so I said, well, that'll be a good test so that I can see which come up first. The first ones that sprouted were the ones that had not been soaked. Now, that might just be a fluke, you know, but that's what, I, what happened for me. All the ones... Uh, that I did not soak come up and then at, gradually the other ones begin to come up and they're all up now they're about that big but okra grows so fast I know it'll be no time and they'll be they'll be really big plants so the row of peanut beans is really doing good uh, and I'm excited about that because we've never grown those before even though they're such a popular bush bean in this area but you can see how crooked the row is it's pretty crooked and um, reminds me of sometimes our corn rows would be there, be like that. They'd get a little crooked. They'd get off by the time that Pap laid them out and then we planted them. So too many hands, you know, all these different hands working in the garden. But Pap would always say, well, a crooked row grows more than a straight row. So down here in the lower part of the garden is where most all of our spring stuff is. And it's just about give out. A lot of it has. We've been eating onions and radishes and lettuce. Uh, my beets are still coming on. They're still doing good. The cabbage inside the covers, they're, they're beginning to get really big. So I know they're doing good. This rain that we've had will really help. will help so much. Rain does what watering just can't do. As we begin to eat the green onions and the uh, radishes and stuff and we pull them up, that leaves some open spaces so that I can begin to replant in those places. I'll probably wait another week or so, but then I'll start putting maybe some more bush beans, uh, maybe some squash or zucchini, some cucumber, some bush type things. I'll start replanting those holes where I pull up stuff. Um, especially once it gets where that whole part is almost empty, then that just gives me another place to plant some succession plantings of the things that I've already started. But down here in the very bottom is where all of our winter squash is, and they are just up and doing really good. Um, they look great. I've got some melons down here too that are doing good. It'll just be no time at all, and that'll all just start running all over the place, and it'll just pretty much be a jungle. But underneath all those big, huge leaves will be some wonderful winter squash that will feed my family through this year if I wanted to eat it, but especially through the winter, even into next year. That's the great thing about winter squash. They last so long, typically. I have a video where I talk about that. You can check that out. Just that if, when you think about food storage, of course, I love to can stuff. I love to dry things. But it's amazing to grow a big pumpkin or a big cushaw or a butternut or any of those winter squashes and just be able to leave it sitting in your, in your kitchen there. Uh, or if you have a better place than that. But for me, I just leave it sitting in my kitchen. And there's some, like, food storage. I've put it up, but I really had... I really didn't have to put it up. I didn't have to put it in a jar. I didn't have to slice it up and dry it. I didn't have to slice it up and put it in the freezer. I, all I had to do was sit it there and then through the winter when I need it, I think, oh, this would be a good day for some uh, kushaw soup or a pumpkin pie or any of those things. There it is waiting on me to, to actually cut up and use even though it's the cold winds blowing and it's been a long time since it was growing in the garden. So I hope you enjoyed seeing how the garden's doing so far as I make a garden here in Appalachia. That's what we say. Are you going to make a garden this year? Or he made a garden last year and it didn't do no good at all. It was awful. Or it was awful good. The garden he made last year was awful good. And we put up all kinds of things. So it's really part of the, part of the Appalachian culture to make a garden and to put up the food that you eat. This time, every part of the um, growing a garden is kind of my favorite because there's just something beautiful about all of it. When you start those little seeds and they barely poke out of the ground, there it's just like almost like you gave birth to a child, you know, you're so excited, you're so happy and pleased that the seed sprouted. When they get up to this where they are now, especially like seeing those rows of beans and and looking back down here and seeing all my winter squash up and and doing good, it is just so rewarding. It's like you can almost feel like you're the uh, sergeant or the colonel of an army and they're all marching forth to do what you've you've bid them do you know it's just such a beautiful 
seen to see them. But then as, as the summer progresses and as those beans start to climb up and there are blooms on them and the bees are working them, uh, that's beautiful too. It's just every part of it, even the my least favorite, the wildness, the kind of the deadness. I, I like the wildness of summer when it's just all crazy, but then after that kind of comes the, the dying part when it kind of turns brown and um, around the edges. I always think of like the whole Appalachian Mountains take on this dusty, rusty kind of, you know, we talk about having rusty feet sometimes that takes on a rusty look, and that's my least favorite time, but there's also beauty in that. It's just being, being part of the world where you grow food and where you take notice of the things around you you can hear the birds I hear them isn't that beautiful to be able to hear that sounds like they're talking to each other some down at granny some up here uh, being part of that is just such a joy and if you can't garden it on the scale that I do uh, I encourage you to if you don't do anything but use one of those little grow bags to just grow some lettuce or a pretty flower uh, somewhere nearby on your deck or in your yard I encourage you to do that but please drop back by often as I celebrate Appalachia which is a whole lot about making a garden